The Broken Dub Podcast analyzes what makes Olympic athletes, comedians, writers, and creatives great. Season one is titled Breakthroughs. This season of the podcast delves into the breakthroughs we have in our respective fields when we destigmatize mental health and move past the roadblocks within our minds. Executive produced by Ellen Utrecht of Nike TV. Hey, see you later. Boom. Take one. Okay. Smrrr. Smash the like, subscribe, follow. You know the drill. This is the Broken Dove Podcast, and I'm your host, Danny Simmons. Christian Pierce is one of the brilliant minds behind some of the funniest viral videos of recent years. A veteran class clown, curator of vibe, and all-around icon, Cap is the humble guy with style every Angelino adores. Christian is the co-writer, executive producer, and star of Facebook Watch's scripted comedy series, The Real Bros of Simi Valley. Christian is also the best-looking social rights activist to have ever graced this fucking planet. Holy cow, his abs are so ripped. They have their own area code. 818, great 18, infinity, one, infinity. He's the auteur behind Us Unmuted. We all need to be heard. This is Us Unmuted, a permanent protest. A longtime Valley institution of badassery. He's more famous than Gronk at U of A. He's <laughs> balanced, he's sweet. He's got good quips and deep dips at the gym. He, <laughs> and, and with no further ado, <laughs> Christian A. Pierce. Thanks Damn, for coming on to the Broken Dove. That was by far the best intro I've ever had. That was insane. I need to like Dude, I, write that down and pass it out to people. What'd you say? I'm like a hype man. I'm like a very tall hype man. Yeah, you're the it's, best hype man I've ever heard. At least for me, I might have to hire you. You just walk around with me. I walk into like a coffee shop and you just, you know, let that rip. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously, uh, you know, we just started 2021. What are some of your goals that you want to kind of achieve so far? And, and what, what have you set for your intentions? I mean, we're diving right into the, to the heavy stuff, huh? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. 20, 2021 is for me about having the courage to, do what's best for me and my dreams. Um, I have a, I have a history of, I'm a, I'm a very, I'm a people pleaser in a sense. Mm. Uh, but for people I like love, you know what I mean? And someone always could use assistance or help with something. So I'm, I'm usually the one helping people achieve their dreams and like taking time out of my schedule and sacrificing my needs and wants for the needs and wants of others. And I still want to be there for my friends and family, but I'm also going to prioritize myself and my goals, uh, you know, I'm creating goals. I want to sell and come out with a few new series. Um, I want to finish a couple feature scripts. I want mm. to host some diverse, engaging conversations with Unmuted. Um, I, you know, at the top of the list is always going to be storytelling. So it's however I can tell as many stories that are close to my heart as possible. I'm going to be on that train. Cool. And I'm also and trying to grow. I, I'm also trying to grow like nine, ten inches so I can be your height. I think that would help me out a lot. So <laughs> you're gonna need you're gonna need 11 inches, dude. I'm a proper <laughs> ogre. I know you are a proper tree. <laughs> how tall? How tall are you? Six two? Six one. Six one. Okay, come on. I I, I, I had to me. give you an inch. Come. On. Yeah. No, <laughs> what about you, man? Yeah, what are your 2021 yeah, goals yeah. looking like? You know, I similar. You know, I I same same thing. I I'm gonna like I put them down. I'm like I'm gonna write a comedy feature, and I haven't written one. I just haven't. I, I kind of been in my own dome for so long. You know, I've written uh, a lot of punch up stuff, a lot of joke writing, and honestly, I put that thing down. And then this this girl who I did improv with for so long, five years, I came across a, a sketch we did, and we we she put it on Funny or Die somehow she i just sent it to her and she reached out and now we're writing this thing and it's called under the influence and it's it's really interesting it's about like kind of like a it's a wonderful life type thing for someone who's a aspiring writer influencer and like overnight they like i wish i never had you know social media and then they wake up and they like don't exist and it's kind of like a a question of what is what is this thing that we are hmm. striving for so it's kind of that's and we're we just like put down a a, a beat sheet and we're, we're doing some meetings next week already. So it's like this thing kind of like intention set. That's one of them. Uh, and I'm in post on my second doc, the grind, Let's go. Uh, which features some like former, uh, major league baseball players. I shot in, in Japan in 2019. So I'm almost done with that one. 
And, but most importantly, this podcast has like kind of been this, uh, evolving, you know, creative outlet that I think is, is pretty significant and, and important. And I feel like it, it's just so effortless and all the people who have said yes, uh, to being involved like you, you, you know, cap. And I think it's a good place to like, kind of talk about goals, have fun. And then also, at, you know, think about, you know, changing the perspective of stigma, especially in Hollywood and, and in mental illness and how that kind of relates to other, you know, uh, other people's mission statements. But yeah, that's kind of, that's the main thing. I got to stop you real quick because we can't gloss over the fact that you said you're working on your second documentary. Let's talk about real quick, your first documentary, which I just watched. It's fucking awesome, man. I really loved it, man. I really loved it. It was so good. Like it touched so many parts of me. You got the DVD. Yeah. I get that. Is that a (laughs) Blu-ray? Yeah, who knows? I, they, they still exist. I need that supper for good Blu-ray. But bro, congratulations. Hats off to you, man. I got to give Thank you, you. I got to give you a roses because I know that took a lot of hard work. You told somebody's story and that's a story that can connect with so many different people in so many different avenues. So hats off to you, man. Thank congratulations. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Seb is it's, it's cool. It's just, uh, that's kind of was like my film school, you know, meeting Seb. I met him at Sony, uh, as a, you know, like a boxing class. And then we started, I started getting into boxing and MMA and all that stuff. And through that, I kind of channeled this idea of creating documentaries. And I didn't know it was something that I wanted to be behind the camera. I usually wanted to be like a writer and an actor improviser guy. And then found that like, man, there's something really fulfilling about human interest stories and every person's so fascinating. So it's just, I got lucky. He it's, he's so charming and it's like this miracle that we found each other, to be honest. Hey man, um, no, no coincidences. As I always say, yeah, it's true. It's true. Do you, so, so I know, I know you and I both share a, a complete, like, it's not even an infatuation. It's a, a, a love for the gym. What, what do you do? What, what are your rituals when you get in the gym and, and, and how do you repeat these rituals and how do they get you into like a meditative state? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, I mean, you hit it right there with the meditative state. Like I've, I always tell people, I actually had to say this, I had to come up with a way to phrase this to people I was close to so that they would understand how seriously I take exercise and going to the gym or whatever your gym is, whatever you make it, your gym could be the beach. It could be an actual gym. It could be, you know, yoga class, but I had to start telling people who were close to me, the girl I was dating, my best friends, like, yo, the gym for me is meditation. Like, because people would want to work out with me and they'd want to, oh, let's do this and that. And I, I had to take, I was taking myself very seriously and it really is meditation for me. Exercise, like, you know, uh, testing and improving my physical, uh, well being it's more than just physical for me. It's physical, it's mental, it's spiritual. And as far as rituals go, I walk into uh, whatever facility I'm working out at. I have a few I work out at right now, which is nice. Um, I walk in, I like to be alone. I have workout partners I work out with, but for the first 20 to 30 minutes, I'd like to be alone. Um, headphones in, sometimes music's playing, sometimes it's not. Uh, but take my shoes off. I go on the turf if there is turf. Yeah, yeah. My first 20 to 30 minutes are, are just barefoot or socks or barefoot. Um, and I've kind of made up my own stretching yoga flow routine that I do. And like, it doesn't have a specific order, but it does have like specific components. And I can hit those components in any order of like whatever I'm feeling that day. You know, it starts with me standing, you know, so I get to one knee and two knees and I'm on the ground, opening my hips up, you know, doing all kinds of like yoga poses. And, and then I, I'm, holding a plank and I go back up and it ends up with me standing again. And that takes about like 15 minutes it can take a little bit longer or less depending if I'm rushing or not. Um, but once I get through that, like I'm invincible, I'm untouchable. Like I'm in my own world. I, I don't care who's looking at me. Um, I just kind of move around and listen to my body. Uh, I'm really big on intuitive movements. So I tap into my body first and you know, I flex all my muscles, my fingers, my hands, biceps, triceps, every muscle in my legs, my feet, my toes. I I get really aware with my body and I tap in and then I start listening to it. Okay, what's tight? What needs to be stretched out? What needs to be moved around? What needs to be rotated? And I do that until I feel warm and loose. And then I'll do some ab exercises, uh, like a short ab routine. And then I usually do some cardio. So I'll hop on like the curve treadmill or, uh, you know, Stairmaster or I'll I'll run on turf. uh, And so that it's like my first 30 to 35 minutes of like exercise and on my, on my slower days where it's, I had a long night or it's going to be a weird day. I'll turn that 25 minute routine into like an, a 45 minute routine. I'll go really slow and that'll be my whole workout. 
like that is like the foundation oh. of my exercise routine. And from there on, I, I've shifted. I used to do mostly weights. He's getting the gym, stretch for five minutes, do abs, and then just hit the weights hard. Now it's I stretch and do cardio for up to like 40 minutes, and I only lift weights for like 35 minutes. How do you take this flow state and like apply it to creativity? Man, there's, it's so crazy. They're one and the same. But the answer is the moment you uh, release self and you are acting purely on intuition, um, on what speaks to you at that moment in time. And creatively, that's something I had to, it's something I always knew, and I'm sure you've always known it too, even as an athlete. Like, But mm-hmm. I had to be reminded, 2020 was a big reminder for me where the universe had to tell me like, yo, bro, you already know everything you need to know for the, you know, for the most part to get this shit off the ground. Just listen to yourself. Like, and that takes dropping your ego. It takes like patience. Mm -hmm. It takes, uh, you have to just really get rid of the self. You can't, you know, take yourself out of the equation and listen to your heart. Listen to, even if it's a comedy you're writing, you know what I mean? Not overthinking things is like another way you could put it. So when I'm in the gym, I'm, I'm, those first 10 minutes are me dropping myself. It's me being like, I don't care who's around. I'm going to listen to my body, whatever kind of weird movement I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. Cause you know, this is right. You know, when I'm sitting down to write, uh, I find that a lot of times it's the shit that stings the most cause it's too real or, you know, it's too hard to approach. Those are the concepts that we might stray away from a little bit, but those are the funniest concepts or like the most like moving concepts. So it's the same thing. You have to like, drop yourself you have to drop the ego of it drop the the fear of it and uh let like that inner light that drives you into you know starting a podcast be that same inner light that you know tells you what you're going to work out today it tells you what joke you're going to write tells you you know when you're going to call a friend so yeah if that makes sense it's it's in, no, I I mean I've been doing like the almost the exact same thing it's crazy like I, I obviously I think in this moment of reflection, 2020 was a year where we're like, well, how do we go internal and find solutions to these, obviously these issues with our society. And obviously the only thing we can control is our inner thoughts and our our internal stuff. And then that flows outward. But I, from that, I've been getting into this meditative state of working out the flow state and, and really, it's been so eye-opening for everything creatively, just like the, even the opportunities and just like the way that I'm shooting shots and every shot is going in. And like the ones that I'm missing, I'm not feeling envy. I'm not feeling, I'm feeling uh, excited for people's successes. I'm feeling at peace with what happens and happened in my past. And I feel like I can kind of move forward beyond like failures and also just things that, you know, as were, were breakdowns, they're now like true breakthroughs. But one of the things that I did and I've been doing is I get up really early and I used to not do this. I used to kind of sleep in and I'll get up before it's, you know, the crack of dawn before the chickens start cocking and crowing. And I'm like, and I put on my song, I have like a, a, a signet, like a series of playlists. One of them is mm. uh, Kanye West waves. And I really, I also mm. just really love Kanye West and my guy. that song I know he's a obsessed. genius. He's just, yeah. he's, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. And one of them is also Paul Simon, the obvious child. I don't know mm. why. And then I put that together and then I have, I have these weird songs, um, that are very like, uh, obviously rhythmic. And then I get my breath in that rhythm. And then when I get my breath in the rhythm and it's outside, it's cold. And I start noticing that the animals are there and I start just like, almost like howling at the moon. It becomes really kind of weird, right? I'm sure it's like a little bit strange. Dude, I dude. feel you, then, bro. I, I howl sometimes too like, to get animalistic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's, and I only have a TRX band and I've broken all my little rubber band things. Cause you know, and, and it just becomes, but it becomes more of this, um, like like flow and then I'm, I'm i'm actually in better shape now too i'm like i've lost more like i'm leaner than i was bro, say uh, it again same bro I, it, it's weird I, I i but i'm not working out harder i know i used to see you at la fitness and you would be like you know exerting so much energy doing like 400 pounds like hip thrust blasters <laughs> and now <laughs> i remember that i'm like holy cow but now you know we're both leaning out it also might be maturity and understanding our bodies too right mm-hmm. and and that in that ego that alpha mind being like we don't have to go all that you know we don't have to go as hard as that every time because there have been some like george st pierre's training uh, his coach talks about like flow state he also talks about 
doing your volume, right? Your volume, you only need to do three reps or four reps a day as opposed to doing 30 reps and then just do those three or four reps every day, Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of mentality. So I think that's probably where we're in a line. Um, Yeah, definitely was, I I always wanted to, my my physical journey has been so interesting because I started playing sports at such a young age. So it was never like, uh, it was always like, uh, it was second nature, like going to the gym, like working out was always second nature and Mm -hmm. it was just a part of who I was. And yeah, I I had different fitness goals along the years. And even when I was like, you know, 18, 19, when we started hanging out, I had, uh, I was always like trying to be, never was trying to be huge, but was trying to be big and like test my limits. But it took me, you know, several years after that to really tap in and be like, okay, like, what do I want now? I've kind of been on autopilot with this. And once I started that journey of like breaking down, like maybe I don't want to be big anymore. Like maybe this isn't the best. Like maybe I don't need to do these workouts. I learned when I was 16 in football, you know, once I got more conscious about just how I approached the whole situation and what was best for me. Uh, yeah. I learned, I changed everything, changed my diet, changed my workout, leaned out a lot and just got back to uh, a state that, it's closer to feeling like the more the real me. Yeah. Leaned out is a, is a very uh, modest term. I would call it shred, (laughs) shred, shred city shredder. Also teenage mutant ninja turtle shredder is here. Okay. Holy cow. Yeah, it is. It is out of control, dude. I see whatever your flow state is. Someone's doing some content when you're jumping rope. And I'm like, dude, that's, I'm worried. We got to give him a bagel. We got to give him a bagel and some locks. Yeah, I get a lot, guy, I get a lot were, of starvation you jokes from so Keep it up. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, bro. Um, appreciate it. <laughs> I'm trying. Man. Yeah. When was so? So when was the? You know. You know. I know you were. Frat life was one of your first viral videos you worked on, right? Am I right in that? Yeah. That you were involved mm-hmm. in that. Yeah. When was the first yeah. time you knew you had the gift at writing comedy? Oh, wow. Shit. I don't know if I've ever been asked that question. Um, gift? I don't know. The imposter syndrome in me wants to be like, you know, laugh that off and be like, what gift? But I guess, um, <laughs> <laughs> real, real shit. I guess I've always been able to make people laugh. Like, you know, I would say class clown gone pro. Um, I always kind of knew how to turn those knobs to get people to laugh at something since I was a kid. Um, I used to get mm-hmm. in trouble a lot. In, in school and my parents are pretty strict and they take school very seriously. They always have. And so like I get to a point where I was getting in trouble too much. And so I used to, you know, read the room in class. This is as early as like third, fourth grade and like come up with my head like, Oh, I have the joke. This is the good thing. It's everyone laugh, but I would give it to the other class clown. And I would say like, yo, you should say this. Huh. And then I'll get people to laugh. And I was like, okay, cool. So I can still make people laugh, even if I'm not the one saying it. Like, that's how I used to get my fix without getting in trouble. And then he can get in trouble. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my, so, wow. Yeah, my parents are the best. See, I did the opposite. I'd hear someone else's joke and steal it. No, <laughs> you'd say it louder. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's all people laughing. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and so, so tell me about frat life. Obviously I, I remember seeing that I was, I believe I, I want to say freshman, but I might've been a sophomore in college. Mm. And I remember someone sharing that with me and I, I thought, I, I remember there's one line. I don't, um, life's a, marathon. A marath- life's a marathon, the, not a sprint. I sprint. Life, marathon. Life's a marathon. Yeah. yeah damn it. Yeah. Did you write that line? I didn't. That was life's actually something mar- Jimmy came up with hats off to him. Okay. Life's a marathon, not a sprint. I sprint marathons. I was yeah. like, that's fucking genius, dude. You know, but you guys, you guys, it's a great line and I butchered it obviously, but no, life's a sprint and a marathon. doesn't matter. Point is, um, you were, I imagine, be, were you behind the camera on that video? What was, I was, that was the first was time your... Jimmy and I worked together on anything. Wow. I was, it was lightning in a bottle. I remember when like, was it face like Facebook viral or YouTube viral? Yeah. So Facebook was hot. You know, Facebook was not new by any chance by any means but it was like the heat of it was new you know what i mean like it was it was becoming like a thing that you know more so like you know oh you don't have a facebook like it was weird for people at a certain age to not have a facebook moms weren't on it yet moms and aunts weren't on it yet so it was still like the cool kids the college mm-hmm. kids were all up on it um and i really do attribute a lot of our success with that video in our first few videos to us being at a school uh where it had a, we had a big reach. We were in the social circles that, you know, we're all freshmen. Everyone comes to school from their other their city, wherever they're from, including Jimmy and I. 
And when we put the video out, we shared a blast. I put it on, I think every single one of my friends walls, like on Facebook, like ham, like one by one. Hey, check this out. Hey, check this out one by one. And then like a lot of those friends were also in college and a lot of those friends were also in Greek life. So, you know, you amplify that times how many, how many other people in our U of A circle were doing that. And I think it just hit a lot of colleges very fast. Um, and you know, it, they took it and ran with it, which was awesome. What was it like moving from Chicago to the San Fernando Valley? Yeah, it was a big shift in my life. So I was seven, about to be eight when we moved from Chicago to LA. Uh, my dad had gotten a promotion at his job. He needed to be on the West Coast. It was between the Bay Area and LA. He chose LA, we moved to the Valley. Um, you know, I was a kid, I, I didn't want to leave my friends, but also I was kind of excited for an adventure. I didn't know what to expect. Chicago, going to school in Chicago, I was in the city and it was, it was much more diverse. Uh, my, you know, ethnic background, socioeconomically much more diverse. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, it was, it was a city, the shy town. I lived pretty close to Wrigley field. So I grew up like walking to, you know, Cubs games. Um, so it was a big difference. Cause you go to the Valley, like, you know, we're in a much quieter neighborhood. Um, the neighbors don't talk or kick it. That was weird for us. Cause we'd be on the block. Like all the neighbors are just hanging out, know each other. Um, and you know, it's much hotter, but you know, it was, it was cool. I think the biggest difference was it felt like kids were a little more reserved when I came to, when I went to school out here, I don't know why, but everything just felt quieter than it did in Chicago. Everything just felt quieter. I mean, maybe that's just the Valley about it, but, um, yeah. So I guess like the diversity was, it was less diverse and a little, a little chiller. And, and how did that make you feel? Kind of, um, you know, I grew up, like I said, like sports household. My dad was like very much a coach. He was a coach. He wasn't my coach all the time, but he was a coach. So like, it's always play through, just play, you know, make the play no matter what. So there, it wasn't really time for me to check in and see how I felt. I don't think at that age, I never checked in and asked myself like how things feel. Now I can look back and be like, all right, I know now I, 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 you know, I definitely felt different. was reminded that I was different a lot. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's interesting growing up being the only, or one of the two, uh, black kids in your class. Um, you're always, you always got eyes on you for something. So, you know, and it was usually either you're a bad kid or a dumb kid, people thought, or like you're a funny, outgoing, athletic kid. Like those are the two polars you had to choose. So me, I was always like, well, I play sports. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a fuck around. So I was just the loud, funny, athletic kid. You know what I mean? Come on. It's, it it's, wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to be what you say it's it's the it's the more fun option if you if you're given two places right it's the more fun option yeah yeah it's, so uh did you do you think that growing up in the valley like you know woodland hill you know woodland hills in with mm. the woodland hill billies you know of the world like it's it's just <laughs> it's a, its own pocket right west hills woodland hills the commons compared to like Wrigley field i mean we're talking what a world of difference i mean for I mean, going, I mean, were you going to Platt? I mean, is that, you went from going to Wrigley Field to like the Platt Village, right? Walking to Platt, yeah, Platt and Victory. <laughs> yeah, literally, that's a big, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, it was a shift, man. What are you going to do but just kind of like be there for it? You know, yeah. as a kid, like you just kind of in the back seat, you get your parents driving literally and figuratively. So, you know, I was just there for it to make the best out of it, my little brother and I. And, you know, we made friends quick. And uh, we just, you know, tried to adapt. It wasn't until, like, I think if I would have moved in, like, middle school mm-hmm. or high school, I would have seen it. I would have been more cognizant of what a huge shift it was. You know what I mean? I would have seen some stark differences and probably would have been less, uh, you know, I probably would have transitioned a little less easy if I was older. Oh, uh, yeah, I can imagine. It, it, it is kind of around your teens. That would even be harder, right? What, um, right. That's what I'm saying. So, so, you know, we talked about the flow. We talked about kind of the meditative state. How do you get into that state, you know, with writing? Like when you see that blank page, when you see like, Oh, I have a deadline and they, they need, you know, Quibi needs a script or we have to hit this deadline for real bros. Like, what do you do to get into it? Is it, <clears throat> is it just like looking at the whiteboard? Is it roll the J like, what's your process? It's different every time. Yeah. Like I'm d- definitely like a, a very collaborative person mm-hmm. and that presents a different challenge because it's not about just you. Like 
you know, there's been a, a lot of times where I walk in the room, I'm like already kind of at the tip of my flow state, I'm ready to go, let's dive in. And, but the other person may not be. And that's not conducive to a final product if like you're just flowing through the day and the other person is just not there yet. Um, so with collaboration, it's, it's always gonna be whatever works. I mean, you play sports, like I always say, I mean, the boys always say like playmakers make plays. That's all that matters. Like, did you make the play or not? Yeah. No coach. All right, well go figure it out. Did you make a play or not? Yes, coach. All right, we'll go to the next play. Like you don't stop to think about, you know, anything really. So with writing, it's the same thing. It's like, look, this shit's got to get done one way or another. So as far as like what gets it done, it's whatever gets it done, mm. whatever it takes. If it takes smoking a couple of J's, cool. If it takes getting a little drunk, cool. If it takes none of that, cool. If it takes, we're, let's take a couple hour break and come back into the room. Cool. Uh, when I'm by myself, like a, a trick I like to use, I tell people if they're like, oh, I don't know how to start the script or I'm stuck on the script, write whatever scene you you can write, whatever, whatever dialogue, even if it's like, sometimes I have an idea for a film and like, I'll be writing, I'll be like 15, 25 pages in and I'll get hung up and like, I'll spend like two days trying to figure out page 26. But in my head, I know I have page 87, 54, 39. I have these little bits and pieces of the story that I see very clearly. So what I'll do is I'll be like, fuck it. I'm going to go to that scene. I'm going to page 39. I'm going to skip there. I'm going to write this piece of dialogue down. Because what happens is I end up writing pages 40 and 41 too. Mm. And then I'm like, all right, that's kind of burnt out. Let me go to 84. I know 84. You know, I wrote this scene that happens at the end. And now I have 80 through 87. And usually that can trigger me. Like, oh, yeah, that's what I wanted to do on page 26. And I go back to like where I started off at. But even if I didn't, I'm now I'm 10 more pages into this feature than I was when I sat down. So like if I can't, if I hit a block and I'm writing chronologically, I just jump to whatever part of the scene I know, whatever part of the, even if it's a sketch, like, fuck, I don't know how to get here, but I do, I know I want this one joke here. So I start at that one joke and I reverse engineer around it. So like, it'll start happening. It just needs to keep moving. You know what I mean? I love that. The no rules. That's kind of, that's like, you know, the napkin state, right? The old school, like the guys, the old writers, they'd be at a bar and just writing on napkins and feeling it out. And then, and then you kind of putting yeah. it around and see, that's cool. And that's very helpful. I got to say these are like, just hearing that perspective, it's like, that is a, it's like a judgment free creativity process. And then all of a sudden it, it sinks, right? It all, our minds are so like when you're, driven to the a project right our minds know that it's going to be finished it's just a matter of where the puzzle pieces kind of play it's cool now yeah obviously we, you know we know we talked about you've accomplished so much you're so young and, and 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 so many people look up to you how do you feel about your accomplishments and, and how do you continue to like move forward i haven't done all the things i wanted to do by this point in my life mm. um and I've hit a lot of roadblocks. I've taken a lot of L's. I've had to start over on a lot of things. I've been told no. I've had projects killed after putting a lot of years into them. So it's hard for me to like really answer the question of like, you know, what do you do with the success? Because it's like, yes, I've had success. Um, but, you know, it's not, I'm not, I haven't done all the things I wanted to do. Now, once again, you know, this past year of like reflection has helped me be more comfortable with where I am and what I have done. And like, I don't like to work on, um, I don't like to hold myself to any timeline standard. You know what I mean? Like that I should complete this by this age, complete this by this age. Cause like any kind of comparing, comparing yourself to other people's timelines, like is, uh, ultimately just, you know, not the best use of your time. So, um, how do I feel about what I've done so far? I, you know, I, I try to be proud of myself. Um, I have to be proud of myself. You know what I mean? But also, I had a moment where I was like, all right, I'm proud of myself for the things I've accomplished. I've done some cool things. I've influenced a, a lot of people and a mm -hmm. lot of people have seen my work. It's, it's entertained a lot of people. It's made a lot of people happy. Um, I've opened doors. That's great. Now, be honest with myself. Like, right, I've, I've, I want to do more. Okay, so like, how do we make sure that that shit doesn't happen on the next tick, on this next run, all right? Like, let's like close the chapter on that and say like, that was a great chapter. I didn't do all the things I wanted to do. The, the protagonist didn't do all the things I wanted him to do. Um, but I got picked up for a second season. That's how I'm feeling. I feel like I just finished my first season. I got picked up for my second. And I'm like, all right, I'm not going to fuck around on this season. We're going to hit the ground. and like, I'm going to kill some main characters in the first episode <laughs> of the second season. It's going to go <laughs> like, Ozark. Not around. It, it's Game of it's Thrones. Going, it's going Ozark. Yeah. Everybody dies. I'm putting Red Wedding season two, episode one. I'm like, let's, <laughs> let's just go at it. Any mentors, you know, I think it, the mentorship is something that 
very is very important. I know that you're mentoring so many people, right? And any mentors that helped you get where you are today? Oh man, so many. I, I'm so blessed to have so many good uh, mentors in my life, men and women. Uh, my dad is he's a very fraternal type dude. You know what I mean? He was mm-hmm. like literally in a frat. He was in a black frat at Michigan State. He grew up with a brother and like his homies in the block. They're still all close. Um, so growing up since I was, I just pictures of me as a baby and it's like my dad and like 15 of his boys in the room watching the football game. And it's like me as like a newborn in his like, in his like Aww. chest. My mom's like nowhere to be, nowhere to be found. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like my mom said, like when I was a baby, my dad used to like steal me and like take me to like his homie's house and they'd be just like kicking it and shit. So I've been blessed enough to grow up with a lot of those men who, uh, you know, my, my parents did a lot of the weeding out for me. So by the time I was like old enough to be influenced by people, um, I got to see people who I was just, you know, people were just spitting game on me about mistakes they made, you know, things they want to do. And also I was blessed enough to be around people who were at one point in life happy doing something. You know what I mean? Like, I think like seeing happy people and hearing happy people talk about the the path they've, you know, gone down and things they would change, things they would, uh, things they still want to do is really helpful. Um, my parents have a lot of cool friends in their life. Some of, some of them aren't happy. Some of them are sad. They've made mistakes, but, mm-hmm. uh, I try to take wisdom from every person, every person older than me. I'm listening to them. I'm listening to their story. I'll sit there for an hour, listen to some, some fool who's older than me talk. Cause I'm gonna learn something. So yeah. I try to impart the same knowledge on anybody around me. That's beautiful. And you know, if you would say, you know, you have one idol, who, who would it be and, and why? Damn, that's hard. One idol. Yeah. One, you know, one Who's rock. Yours? One Warm, loop me up. Loop me up. Who's yours? <laughs> yeah, I, I would. I mean, I think that there's this guiding force in my soul, and it's sort of like, well, I mean, Kanye West is sort of one of the, one of those idols. I don't. I, I believe. I believe he's transcendent of uh this realm personally and that's very weird same dude i think yeah he's i can go on i can go on days talking about that dude man he's uh, next he's next level i actually actually know i yeah. know that in my heart i like i know that he's of a different plane of existence and i think that's why i saw some people say some stuff over his, his recent meltdown which was sad obviously he cycles with hypermania and that's awful and it's an actual physical and um, well, i actually had a, a friend who i, I actually I, and i hate to be this cancel culture but he said some really hurtful things because he knows that I have, I have the same exact thing uh, Kanye has. So I kind of, obviously I empathize and sympathize on a level of hypermania and and these bouts with, you know, bipolar disorder differences. I take medicine and I uh, don't believe that, that I I know that I need medicine because, you know, he's obviously hindering his physical being. He's like in pain. Um, but yeah, I, I think that he's actually his consciousness is of something that's godlike. I actually know it to be right. He has a, and that's what I think is overwhelming. Personally, is that we as humans can't fathom what is God. We can't. We just can't. And it actually causes the human existence to have a meltdown, in my opinion. Uh, mm-hmm. That, mm-hmm. and that's just what my soul connects with. Is that once we connect with something that's of this, uh, of the spirits, right. Of this, like the spirits are guiding us, whatever we want to call it, synchronicity, the universe, then our, our body gets really confused by this, our brain, cause it's a brain. It's just like a muscle. It's just like you're, you're cracking knuckles and your feet, your brain is the same thing. And I think that his brain, just like mine, when that happens, when God comes into my soul and whatever that, whatever that is, it's very rare. And his happens way more frequently than anybody because he's very close Mm -hmm to God when that happens he says stuff that he shouldn't and 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 it's it and then the the haters who are on the sidelines uh want to tear something down that they don't understand and 100 percent, bro I feel the same this, way this guy said some stuff like fuck Kanye he's like he he's a bad per-. like he said bad per- like he's a bad person he should be can't like not more than canceled he's like he's an he's an awful person 
in many words. And then he started saying, fuck you, fuck your illness. You don't even give a shit. You don't know what you're talking about. And he just started coming Whoa. at me. And I, was like, I was like, dude, I don't like, oh, I was, and he's like, I, and he what? said, this is what he said. I'm going to, I screen, he screenshotted it. You know, you can see when you screen, it's like, I'm going to share this on my story. You, you know, about you saying that you aside with Kanye, Kanye. And I was like, dude, that just like also is really hurtful. It's something private to me at the time. I wasn't talking about it publicly. And I was, and I was like, man, that's, really hurtful uh wow shoot you're gonna you're gonna out me for having bipolar disorder ah fuck because i like you know that that's something i can relate to kanye west on and it really hurt my feelings a lot um but at the end of the day through that now we're here at the breakthrough place and it's like now i'm talking about it and it's part of this next like our upcoming section where we destigmatize mental illness right so I could see it in one way. Is it a negative thing or is there the silver lining of this playbook that it's actually a real positive thing? Um, mm. mm-hmm. what, what do you think? Man, that's a lot. And I, I, I resonate with so, excuse me, that's a lot. And I resonate with so many different parts of uh, what you just said. I, I will say first, I'm a huge Kanye West fan, um, like die hard. Yeah. Not and like, yes, his music and, but not also just him. Mm-hmm. I'm a fan of almost everything he does. Um, I, years before, okay, so 2013, I think, is when he had that interview with Sway, where he, like, freaked out on uh, mm. Sway in the Morning. was like, how Sway? How Sway? That whole yeah, interview yeah. after his, like, Nike stuff wasn't happening. And it was in that interview that I had just lived with a dude at U of A, a dude I didn't know. We had, like, matched as random roommates, and he had Asperger's, and I had lived with somebody who had Asperger's for the first time. Mm. And I had heard about Asperger's and never like seen it up close and personal. Then I saw that interview and I was like, oh, okay, Kanye has Asperger's. Like it, it, all, it all made sense to me. Now I had never even questioned anything, anything crazy Kanye did before. Cause like it never really bothered me. Yeah. Uh, Cause it, it never seemed that big of a deal. Cause I will say in the realm of entertainment guys, you're here to be entertained. Okay. <laughs> you're here to be entertained. Let's get that very clear. <laughs> Do I not entertain you're, you're you? Entertained. <laughs> you? You are not going to to look to be entertained and then getting mad at someone for their political beliefs. Okay, they are an entertainer. Um, so I saw that and I was like, oh, I think this fool has Asperger's. Like, I think that I thought that he is saying real shit and he, you know, he's going from a good place, but he just doesn't understand the cues of this conversation. He doesn't seem mm. equipped for, to respond to these questions. He doesn't seem equipped for this environment. For someone I know is like highly intelligent, highly tapped in on a different level. Cause I listened to his music. I studied his music. I listened to late registration probably 800 times my entire mm-hmm. life. It, I've listened to it a hundred times before I even turned 14. It's one of my favorite albums of all time. So like I, uh, knew him to be a highly like elevated spirit in the mind. So to see him kind of freak out and just go through this like, you know, back to back bouts of like freaking out. I was like, Oh man, my man's not equipped for these mm-hmm. situations. You know what I mean? I thought it was Asperger's back then. And maybe he, that is something he, he deals with, but like, yeah. um, it's very clear cut. And I thought also like, well, hold on, I'm 20 years old, 21 years old. And I just saw this, like, why aren't medical professionals coming out and being like, yo, hold up guys. Like stop ganging up on this fool. Like, it's clear like he's not the same as everyone else in the room. And that's when I realized, like, oh, okay, because everyone loves it. Everyone like needs someone to shit on. Like, I heard friends of mine coming out the woodworks when Kanye first started having these little like, you know, more serious like publicity situations who don't even know the dude's music and we're just so ready to shit on him. I'm like, dude, you only care about the dude when it's time to shit on him. Like, I'm not a fan yeah. of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and I do think he has, he is in some transcendent level of, you know, what is God, you know, but whatever it is, he has, he is bigger than his time. He's bigger than his era. And mm-hmm. I think he realizes that whether consciously or subconsciously. And I think it scares him. I think there's so much he wants to do. And there's so much he has the capability of doing. Um, and there's so many people he wants to touch. And there's so many things he wants to create. But he also realizes the finite nature of uh, human life. And I think a lot of people feel that way when they realize, oh man, I want to do so much and I can do it. Like you get your first success. Like, damn, I did something. I mean, I can do a lot more. I can do all this stuff. But then it's like, but you know, father time. 
he only gives you so much mm -hmm. you start thinking about it and i think that makes him kind of anxious and i think when people slow him down that's when you really see him get upset when his process gets slowed and someone's like well hold on a second kanye you see him like trying to break out like no yeah. <laughs> don't tell me to hold on because he has so much to do he's like i only have so little time like let me finish what i'm doing we'll talk about this later yeah so like i feel for my man like i i was one of the first people to stand up when he said that, like slavery was a choice thing and be like yo calm down like listen to what the man says here he's not he's not saying that all listen he was he needs a translator danny he needs a <laughs> professional translator to walk around with him he could hire me if he wants i'll walk around with kanye and i will translate the shit he's trying to say to the people because i really think there is a good heart in everything this dude tries to say and people like take his you know miscalculated miscal way of presenting it or you know probably not even calculated at all and they make a feast out of it you know how many people make money every time Kanye West, like, quote unquote, fucks up? Oh my God. They eat off of him. Yep. They're praying for you know People yeah. sleep better at night with their own existence, knowing there's somebody else out there that fucked up worse than them today. They love it, bro. They love in in, a, in in many ways. You know, that reminds me of the Key and Peel sketch, the the translator, <clears throat> where, um, when when it's like the Obama translator. Do you remember that sketch? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah, of course. Like, yeah. And, um, Hey, this is a low-key humble brag. I played saxophone underneath those sketches. Two of them, no less. Comedy nice. Central, yeah, that's dope. It's a little. I, I intentionally plugged it. Um, no, but yeah, the it's like we need a. We definitely need a Kanye translator because it's just. I agree with you. I mean, he. I don't. I don't understand the nuances of everything. To me, I just read it as he's not acting in as himself at this time. But but that is maybe a, a good way to put it. He just doesn't um, communicate the way that these uh, that other people want him to and like we want i think the one thing like, that nor should he like who he shouldn't the way we communicate like it's not, it's not working our way communicating is the best it's just yeah. the way we fucking do it yeah it's not working it's anyway. definitely it's not working so. we are not communicating well for whatever reason but yeah it's interesting that you said that yeah he he definitely we're gonna do that we're gonna see we're gonna by the end of this year we're gonna connect you two up I'll be I'll be the hype man, mm -hmm. and you'll be the translator. There you go. And we have a tr we have a trifecta. It's a triple threat. It's done. <laughs> it's done. Wow. <laughs> then he then then he could win that presidency. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But uh, as far as like his mental health goes, like yeah. I think it's I think it's fucking sad that people pray. I have I know people who you know are quote unquote advocate for mental health uh, you know rights and mental health awareness on, on Instagram anyway or when we talk about it anyway. Yeah. But then they jump on Kanye West. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I, that is like so hypocritical to me. Yeah. Um, and it's like when it's convenient for them, they're advocate for it. And I think when he came out with the, uh, I hate being bipolar. It's awesome. That's fucking great. And the first track is like, you know, I thought about killing you. And when that, I when the album dropped and I listened to that first song and like looking at that album, like cover, I was so happy. I was like almost in like the verge of tears. I was like, yes, my man's like taking power of the situation. He's acknowledging the situation. He's taking control over it. Like, fuck yeah, this is what we need. And it really shut a lot of people up because people for a while couldn't say anything. Like he's owning up to it. He's saying he struggles with it. And he's gonna make it a superpower. And it wasn't until like he had a little, some kind of publicity slip up later on. Everyone was like, no, see, he's still crazy. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, he should be like, we should be putting him up and like yeah. making a good example out of him. But we I think he's going to arc. If you want to know the truth, this is my D. I think he gets on Depakote. He gets on the same thing I take. And it sucks. Like, it really does. It gives you this a year to two years of like, it will just, you're not going to be productive. You won't, you will get fatter. You will fall asleep. You will become lethargic. But then you come through the other side and it's like, you know, I don't have these moments where I'm putting on a bulletproof vest metaphorically mm -hmm. and having press conferences that are in my own small sphere, not, I mean, nowhere near as significant, but meltdowns, you know, and instead when you hinder that, that's you, but you still get that experience where the consciousness you connect with animals and all things like he does. Um, but I, th I would love for him to be like a mental health advocate where it's not just, I, I hate being bipolar. It's awesome. It's, I hate being bipolar. It's awesome. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, the work, you know, the actual, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but who knows? I'm, I'm a, once again, side, you know, armchair expert. I don't know. I, I, I wish I, ha I <laughs> wish I was, I wish I was laying it even, even right now. I wish I had what he has. It's, He's just so such a force, but um, I want to you know segue into obviously something that you know because 
that's an arc and, and everything's life is about arcing and, and, and adjusting and making and in, in life is a game of adjustments. You were inspired in 2020 to make a series of, of adjustments. Uh, and, and that was with us unmuted and, or us unmuted. I might be saying that wrong. Um, that's good. and I was really inspired by the entire pr- production, the way you promoted it, obviously the the energy behind it and the spirit and just everyone who all the players, it just seemed like it was like, man, this is such a cool it was so representative of LA and your friends. How did that transpire? What inspired you to make it happen and what's next? Yeah, man. Um what inspired me to make it happen? It was such a I don't know, it's not funny, but I think it's funny because I'm fucked up. But like, it's a funny shift how everything went down because, you know, stay at home order happens in like March, mm-hmm. right? And uh, I was working with Jimmy at the time. We were like quarantining together, but we were together for about three weeks, three to four weeks. And then we had like finished all the work that was on our plate. So I just started like staying home by myself, me and my dog. And, you know, in those coming weeks or month and a half, like I was thriving. I was coming up with my, I was like in a, my own creative renaissance. I was waking up every day. I was working on like three new projects. Like I was like so happy just writing and just editing things together. It was so sick. <clears throat> I was in this really good place. And then, you know, late May rolls around and, or actually May rolls around and cops start killing black people. And, um, you know, unfortunately at, at first, you know, it was very normal for me, like and everyone else, like, you lose Brianna, you lose Ahmad, and then George Floyd's killing surfaced, the video surfaced, and um, still for me, still for me, um, as sad as upset as I was, as like like just in a dark place as I was, it was still a bit of normal for me, mm. and because black people getting murdered murdered by cops for years, and like no one's really ever cared that much, at least it, to to my perspective, like, um, so I was like, you know, this is, I was sad, but this is somewhat bit of normal. What really triggered me was seeing the amount of people I knew. There was nowhere to run. This was quarantine. Everyone was home. Everyone was on their phones. Everyone was on TV. Nothing. It was nothing to run in front. There was no way to say you weren't seeing what was going on for the first time. Mm-hmm. And there was no way in my opinion, that people should be allowed to not have opinions on what's going on. Even if you're not gonna speak up for what you think is right, I didn't think it was right that people were staying quiet at all. Mm. When something that was so clearly affecting our our country, our society, our humanity was boiling. And a lot of people close to me who I consider friends, people I love were either like, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this has been happening this whole time. Like, where have I been? Or they were saying like, uh, you know, I don't know how I feel. That set me off. Mm. That like, to hear that so many people close to me were so, were choosing, actively choosing to take an easier route to the situation, which was being like, just not tapping in, not sitting down for five seconds to think about it. Uh, you know, I, I, when I started expressing how I was feeling on social media, just as a way of like, I would, you know, that was just me being me. Like I, I, something was going on. I had to talk about it. I had to speak up about it. This is how I felt. It was very much instinctual. Like I wasn't like I was planning this shit out. It was like, it just came out of me. I was throwing shit up and I wasn't thinking twice about it. I was just like, this is how I feel. The response to the things I was putting out are what really set me off. Like I had friends call me to check in on me, quote unquote, but I'd say 75% of those phone calls were for them. They weren't for me. They were for people to feel better about what was going on. They wanted me to relieve whatever guilt they felt about not speaking up about it, about not thinking about it. So by checking in on me, I, I, I realized by the second or third phone call that these were kind of half-assed check-ins. People were just kind of wanted to check it off their list that they checked mm-hmm. on a black friend. And... Um, those weren't just assumptions I came up with. Like I, I started asking people who called me like questions that like weren't even hard questions just to kind of see where they were at mentally with even the phone call. And it, they all seemed a little bit empty. Um, so it was that. And, you know, I, you and I have both have a lot of really intelligent, talented friends who do a lot of amazing things. Yeah. And I'm, I'm big fans of all my friends. I'm big fans of some of my enemies. You know what I mean? People I don't like. 
and I know it takes a lot of effort and brain power and emotional power to to create some of the things that my friends create or to pass the bar and be a lawyer or to, you know, take the MCAT. It takes a lot of time and effort that these people are obviously capable of because they've done it. I hated when I heard someone say, they, you know, like, I don't know, this is like a tough thing. I don't really know how to feel. It's like, that's because you're not putting any fucking effort in. Mm. If you would put an ounce of the effort you put into studying one of those days for the MCAT, just one of the, pick one day and use a 16th of the effort that you use to study and just think about what's going on mm -hmm. and how it could affect people. I think you have a different perspective. So people's lack of inclination to even try doing that. It was an amalgamation of all these things mm -hmm. where I was just like, I was hit with, okay, so I need to say something now. Cause like I, th you know, I told someone recently, like, and I wasn't like trying to make a point, but I was just like, a lot of my friends who aren't black only have black friends because I introduced them to their black friends. Mm. Like I am their way into this, like this, you know, this reality. And mm. like, these are people they've foster relationships with and that's great. I want them, I want everyone to be friends. I want to love each other. However, like we are like, they're not accessories. Like this, this world is not an accessory when you feel like tapping into it. So when I saw that people were choosing not to tap into the situation, or were closed off to it, I was like, okay, I like, I just like snapped. And I was like, I need to start being loud. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that the people who, cause I don't, I'm not loud like that. So I was like, all right, if I do this, people are gonna realize this is fucking, this is serious. So I just had that shift. And one of the big things that I think helps people um, warm up or open up to other people's perspectives and experiences. It's just hearing real people just talk, seeing real people just be real, um, unscripted. And you know, like I said, we, you and I both have a, a diverse friend group. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna just cut to the chase. I'm gonna put all these people in a room together and we're gonna fucking talk it out. There's gonna be no judgment. Everyone's gonna be able to say how they feel. They're gonna, people can express what they don't know, what they do know, their experiences. People can express whether they're mad, angry, like they don't agree with things going on, no judgment, we're just gonna get it out there because I'm tired of people acting like they had no idea these things existed. So now there's no more excuses because I'm getting you know, 30 real people in a room from different backgrounds, they're all gonna say where they came from. So from here on out, if you choose to turn the other cheek, like you didn't know, it's on you, you knew when you did it. It's on so, you. Yeah, so I just wanna give people the chance to open dialogue to say their experience so that you know, hopefully someone can pass it along to the next person. Yeah, I was really touched and, and moved and uh, obviously it's just cool to see, you know, just through the friend group, I know Zhang and I mean, to see you guys, everybody producing something so important in the pandemic, finding this uh, voice that obviously you're the, you know, kind of the I don't want to say the conductor of, you know, you're, you're kind of the Dr. Phil of this, the show. And I thought it was really just the, the cinematography and also just the way that you, you asked and posed the questions and kind of forced people to have these uncomfortable moments is really cool. And it's unique. And, and I'm excited to see where it goes next. Cause obviously, as we know, this is the systemic violence against black people. It isn't going anywhere, sadly. And it seems to be, you know, even just, I mean, every day, it, it, it's strange how we perceive the differences. I mean, it's obvious. It's obvious. It's like, I don't need to mansplain it. But I I watched something that really, um, the artwork that is coming out of this, the Renaissance, right, that, that is coming out of the pandemic is incredible. There's this um, short film on, on Netflix called Cops and Robbers, which is uh, based on uh, Ahmad and, and obviously his murder. Mm. Uh my my mentor on Suffer for Good actually was one of the directors on Cops and Robbers. I, I, I suggest you watch it. It's, uh, uh, you know, all made by, I think it's over 50% black animators. So it's a 50% animated around the world. Hundreds of animators came together. This um, incredible director and writer, Timothy Ware Hill, made this poignant, uh, like, spoken word it looks like it's almost on the same street where Ahmad was killed. And it's just, I mean, it will, I, I send it to some, my, I have a friend who during the Capitol uprising, I don't know what you call it, the, the storming of the Bastille, whatever we, you know, whatever that was, she started 
posting these things that were very disturbing. And I was very disturbed by them. And I said, hey, you need to watch this because I, I have no idea why you're saying all lives matter. I don't know what that has to do with this. And you need to watch this, Cops and Robbers, because if if you watch this, it's a four minute short film. I, I mean, I, it, it encapsulates pretty damn well obviously it can't do everything but it you know it's not that much time it's not that much time right like you said it's it's your mcat it's not you are about to get your phd in something that doesn't matter and you can't put in four minutes she didn't even watch it she just went on this rant i mean i had like this is a friend i've known for years i had to unfollow her i had to be like i can't i just can't even like my blinders are on they're on to this some of these things and and but i have to say i'm excited for when you know i'm obviously a little weird I'm excited for part two, 2021, what you're going to achieve. Cause it's not, it's just the beginning and we have time that the one cool thing with what you did is you started one step and I, you know, I know you're not going to stop now. It's like, you're, you know, that's the flow you're in is you're starting from your group of friends, which is a artistic group of people. I mean, everyone that is going to, the influence is going to change from the ground up. Even just one, you're you inspiring me helps my friend who's an influential dude. He f- was uh, impacted by it, and he came to the protest. That's where I ran into Reg and Jay Harp, and one person. So it's like right, that. Tell me, and it's like one to one to one. And if we keep thinking about these one to ones, it does really. You know, that's that. I keep referencing this chicken soup for the soul. My the first one I read when I was in like kindergarten, where it's about the starfish, and there, you know. There's the the young girl and she's throwing the starfish back in the sea and they're all you know the, the tide has come in and there're thousands there's a sea of starfish on and, and the the sun is setting and a guy goes up to her well, you can't save all the starfish just enjoy the sunset what's what are you doing why are you running and, and crying and freaking out you're not going to be able to save all these starfish and she, you know it doesn't matter and she goes it matters to this starfish and then she keeps doing it and running and throwing them in and that's it it's like a very one page mm, allegory it's and it's deep and you're like that thing gives me chills right now it's like wow that's that's our purpose that's our mission you know and that's your mission obviously with with uh, us unmuted it's just like it's the one starfish mentality and yeah, it's 100%. really cool what you did and or continue to do. So I, I have a, I have a question. So we, you know, I think maybe it's two, three years ago at this point, we once, you know, had our a bro hang a little a schmooze and a breakfast. And, and before I was really moved, you know, you, you prayed before your meal. And I remember that it stood out, you know, stood out to me. I was like, wow, you know, breakfast, it's also a vulnerable thing, right? I don't, you know, you didn't know if I'm, you know, I don't think we talk about religion, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, so why do you, why do you pay, you know, pray and, and how does that faith kind of come into your life and, and everything you do, like such as us unmuted? Yeah, um, that's a good, wow. Uh, that's something I, I mean, I do, I pray for my meals, so I would never even like thought of mentioning that. Um, I started, I grew up in a religious household, mm-hmm. I grew up Lutheran, you know, and, um, you know, we were brought up to pray before our meals just because, like, that's how you bless your food and, you know, how you make sure it's healthy for you to eat. And I, I, I was actually one of the only kids I knew that did it as a kid, as a teenager, for anybody, because I was just, like, you know, I was definitely self-conscious about it growing up, but I was always like, fuck it, it's also my food. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> um, And even though I'm not as much of a religious person anymore, any like one religion, I am still very much a spiritual person. I still like very much a faithful person. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, blessing my food has changed over the course of the years, but I still do it. And now what it is, is just a moment to be thankful for this gift and also to accept an intention as I put it into my body. Um, it's just something that's just always made me feel good. It just feels like a part of me. And, and I, and I, when I don't do it, like I feel a difference. Mm. Um, maybe, I'll, you know, I miss a Maybe I miss a meal here and there if I'm really distracted, but I always try to take a second and like, think about it. Like I'm about to eat this thing. It might be a hot dog, but like one of these hot dog, like, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm glad I get to have this hot dog. Like yeah. I hope this hot dog only has, you know, the best, you know, effects it could possibly have on me. <laughs> and, you know, I also want to be mindful that there's people out there that, you know, don't have this and they wish they did. So, yeah, that's cool. And and from that background, you know, growing up Lutheran, how do you do? You, do you feel like you know you? I think you lead with a lot of forgiveness. Do you think that a, a lot more people can 
follow in your footsteps and and lead with for forgiveness and and give uh, more people a second chance is that something that you kind of align with yeah definitely i, I would hope so like I, i've always been the kind of person that i can't stay mad for too long mm -hmm. like it doesn't matter what somebody does to me i can't stay mad for too long um and now as an, an older guy i've seen i've seen what happens when you don't forgive people you know what I mean? I've seen like resentment grow over years. Mm -hmm. It's not worth it. I think forgiveness is such an important thing. Um, it, it reminds us that we're human, that we all make mistakes. We all hurt people. We all get lost. We all, we all do things that, you know, deserve to giving forgiving and we all should forgive other people. I think definitely people should learn to lead with forgiveness. I know that's a hard path, especially for people who feel like maybe they've had a harder path than others. Cause you know, where's the forgiveness for them? They might feel like, um, I think forgiving yourself is usually the first step in that too. If you learn to forgive yourself for the things that you you regret or things you feel upset about or the times you've hurt people, maybe you even told anybody about it, like forgive yourself for those and that'll start the pattern of like forgiving other people. But a hundred percent, I think that's something that doesn't get talked about enough, bro. Mm. I think also for, I, for, I I need to forgive myself too. Like I I'm such a like I think being an athlete, right? Like you and I both were trained to kind of be so hard on ourselves, and even mm -hmm. you know you talked a little bit about imposter syndrome, and I I'm not even at that place yet. I'm I'm at imposter. I haven't finished syndrome. I'm I'm like halfway. <laughs> but, <laughs> I feel you. Bro. I might be there too, honestly. You know, and but I'm still you know I need to forgive myself for those failures and for these these moments where maybe it's. I didn't complete this thing or I said something the wrong way or I, I didn't, I got ang angry and, and I could always, r I need to re realize that, you know, like you said, I'm, I'm a big dude. And when a five foot four guy with, with power alleys, you know, crossing down his, you know, all the way down his head gets upset, it's different hmm. than when I get upset. People, you know, it's, there's fear when I, if I were to strike someone, it's, you know, it's it, tr genuine pain. You know, it's not, right. you know, I've had friends of mine who throw stuff at me. If I throw something, I played baseball. It's going to hurt. It's a danger. You right. know what I mean? It's, and, <laughs> but I don't, you are a lethal it's weapon, a lethal weapon in, but I don't do it. And that's, it's not in my heart, but you know, those things are, you got to forgive. I got to forgive, not just others is like myself for my failures. Now this, the kind of segues perfectly to our second chance, uh, you know, in hashtag stop the stigma section. Give us a moment. We'll be right back. The Broken Dove Podcast is sponsored by Kilo. Kilo app takes a qualitative approach to tracking your mental health by analyzing the quality of your sleep, workout, diet, even libido. Kilo keeps me dialed in. Kilo motivates me to work hard in and out of the gym. It also helps me maintain relationships and keep perspective because no matter how bad you got it, someone has it worse. And trust this, we need you out there. Maybe do it for your son, your student, do for someone you've yet to meet, your inner savage. Dig in and do work. Kilo, building better humans. Okay, so we're back. You know, I, I already have opened up about, you know, my mental illness and my issues here, right? And, and, and it's been a, you know, five years I haven't had an episode, a manic episode. So I'm in like full remission, they call it. Right. And various other, yeah. other stuff. It's great. It's, a, it's a blessing. Like, seriously, it's a beautiful thing. I'm taking my medicine and all that stuff. Have you, you know, it, you or anyone in your circle or your life struggle and suffer from mental illness? Yeah, definitely. It's funny. Cause like it's, ugh, I wasn't even able to acknowledge like a lot of people, especially black people, like you probably heard this, like mental illness is like not a thing to black people. Like mm -hmm. until like, you know, it's still not a thing. We're still trying to wake people up. Um, I'm trying to, we're, you know, we the people who know are trying to wake our community up. But I grew up with, I remember when I was like 12, somewhere right there in the beginning of middle school, I was always a great student. It was, school was always very easy for me. Like I always excelled, was always yeah. one of the top two class scores whatever when i got into halfway through middle school i saw like my focus kind of waning a little bit mm -hmm. and i was hard on myself i didn't get why i was like what the fuck why is this getting so hard for me to like keep reading and that kind of thing and then i shortly after got a friend of mine was telling me how she got diagnosed with adhd which i didn't I, i'd heard about that but i i thought up to that point it was just something for bad kids like bad mm. kids had add those just for the bad kids have 
And I was, so here my friends say this. I was like, what do you mean? No, you don't have that. Like, you're not one of those crazy kids like in like this small yeah. classrooms. And she's like, no, it's not like that. I have this. And like, now I feel a lot better. And she talking about the symptoms and I was like, oh shit, I actually am feeling all those same things right now. So I remember working up the courage and going to my mom and being like, hey mom, I was talking to my friend and she was saying this and that. And I think I ha might have that same thing. Or like, I would love to go see a doctor. And very quickly, my mom said, no, that's not a real thing. Mm. ADHD is not a real thing. That just means you need to, that means you need to focus harder. Mm. And I remember just being like, all right, well, that's a hard no. And like, that was something I struggled with, you know, that just continued and only got worse. And um, then I remember like uh, there was a couple times when I was about 18 when I just would like wake up and would just be like so fucking sad about things. Mm. And I just like, and I just didn't, and I was just, it was just an all day thing. And like, you know, I just played it off. And then I remember there was like a, it was, had gone on for like some time before I was talking to a friend about it, someone close to me. And I was like, yeah, dude, I've just been like, so sad. Like, I don't know what it is. I think this might be like, I think I might be depressed. And then he said like, nah, man, you, you just got to snap yourself out of it. Like depression is something you just like snap yourself out of. And I was like, all right, I guess I'm just sad and tripping. You know what I mean? So like I never really had with my own experience I never had uh, any validation that this were a real thing. It, it wasn't until I was around certain friends who were dealing with mental health issues, like shortly thereafter, who were getting medicated for it and like seeing therapists, and I started like reading up and seeing like, oh no, this is like a real thing. And it was a little bit, little too late for one of my experiences. Where one of my best friends growing up from high school. He was part of our same group that you, you know, some of my homies, he's part of the same group. We played ball together growing up after high school. He started dis displaying a few odd tendencies. He's a little bit different. And it was like, every time I'd come home for summer, he'd be a little bit more off, a little bit more out there, a little more unpredictable, kind of like aloof. And I, I took him under my wing one summer. He was our age. He was one of my best friends. And like, I remember after my junior year, like, I took him under my wing the whole summer, you know, me and Jimmy were full fledged shooting videos and that kind of thing. And so he was with me every day and I saw things were off, but I didn't know. I was just like, Hey, my man's had a past couple years that I wasn't there for. Like, I don't, who knows, you know, but yeah. my other friends were like, nah, man, stay, stay away from me. He's a weirdo now. He's weird. He's strange. You know, they would like make fun of him. Like they were still kicking with us, but they would just, they were, they were always making fun of him, calling him weird. He's different. He's changed. And, you know, I went back to school and shortly thereafter, he like spiraled downward like at a very very like fast rate um and did a bunch of crazy things and you know he now i know he's clearly manic depressive schizophrenic possibly like suffers from both but it wasn't till like a year after that talking to another black friend who grew up in the valley whose brother was dealing with it wow. and all the research i was like oh shit this is a sickness oh shit these are the signs you know, and I was like, oh, fuck. And I realized, like, I'm too late. Not too late. You know, I, at that point, I didn't think I was too late. But it was a part of me that was just like, all right, we got to play catch up now. You know, we got to play catch up and go save the homie. But when I went and go told my our other close friends, like, yo, let's go save the homie. He's, I think he's going through these things. Let's get him some help. They were like, nah, fuck that. He's not sick. He's tripping. Like, they yeah. really didn't understand mental health. I have friends who really still don't understand. They don't want to believe it. They think depression is just, you're really sad. They think it's controllable. So mm. it's a hard uphill battle, man. Cause it's, it's, you can't speak to somebody. You can't have a conversation with somebody until you're speaking the same language. And in this case, I can't have a conversation with my friends about it until they understand the language of mental health is like a fucking physical health issue yeah. that like takes, you know, professional help. Um, so it's a battle I'm fighting. It's it's slow moving, but it's moving. And there's, you know, I've already like, I'm not gonna say completely lost, but somewhat lost some people close to me because I just wasn't up on game yet. Um, I'm glad I was able to get over the, you know, the shit that I deal with. I mean, this past year, I definitely battled with depression. Like this summer, like like I was in a super just dark place. The world was just, everything was terrible for me. It was just like waking up. I think there was probably a two week span that felt like one long night to me. Wow. Um, uh, so I've been through it. I'm sure I haven't seen the end of it. And I know there's a lot more people who are going through it, who the people around them don't even know it's a real thing, bro. So, you yeah. know, it's a lot. I mean, uh, it, you, thank you for sharing. And, you know, the one, there are a few things. One that I, what you said, which is never give up, you know, your friend 
reach out if you can, because I, I've had even just a little bit of love. I think we, we have to, that's our forgiveness. That's our, our, our calling is to lead with love. And, and also even in my life, it's not just the black community. It's a lot of the stigmas there in all communities, but you, you are, you know, you can speak to that for sure. And, but even my dad, you know, I had my first episode in 2014 and I had psychosis, arrested at gunpoint, the whole thing. Obviously, my privilege paid off, but they heard, uh, the cops heard that I had an ax. I was playing my sax. And that was the first time I realized when you get pit, you know, pigeonholed into a, a rap sheet, what and how that followed me through even the hospitalization process of going to the from the police, you know, 5150 me, putting him in the hospital, going to the ambulance, then going to the, the mental hospital, being put in the hospital with the violently ill people. And then realizing after 24 hours, they're like, why are you here with the criminally insane? Which is a thing. It's an actual different, there are different rooms. There's the rubber room and then there's, there's the insane that, are, that they just tried to commit suicide. And then there are the people who actually went on and had bath salt experiences and were biting people's jugulars, those kind of things. And they're a different place. Damn. And I was playing my sax. And they thought I had an ax. And that thing, I kept saying, yada, 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 doesn't matter. You know, recovery for a year. I thought it was just maybe drug-induced psychosis. I was sober at the time, but I did a bunch of partying at Coachella before. So I was like, maybe this Coachella was a weird experience. And my dad knows that he knows that this bipolar is a presiding issue in our family's DNA. And there's nothing wrong with my father. You know, I love him. But, it, you know, my grandma, who I never met, her death is you know, the coroner ruled it suicide. And my uncle um, sides with that definition. Obviously, there's a discord. There's a little denial on, on in our family. And, and this is not for me to decide, right? And it's, but it's that stigma. Like, what? why is that a conversation? Your son could have been shot. You know, guns are drawn. Safeties are off. Things are happening. Shit's going down. And you don't think to say, hey, maybe this is a an issue in our family and it's okay, son, you know, and it took another year for me to come back and then actually just to call my godfather, my uncle and tell him, Hey, I know my cousin has this and I have this and I'm crying and I'm, you know, like, I'm sorry. And he thought I was kidding. He's like, Hey, you, there's no way you have this. You're a smart kid. You know, and the same thing, you know, you're not a weird. Yeah. It's always like, no, you're a smart you're kid. You're like, what does yeah. that have to do with anything? Like Andy Richter talks about, it. he's like, I'm a happy person and I have this pit in my stomach and it's depression. And you know, how could Christian Pierce have it? He has everything in the world. It's like, you know, he's good looking. He's smart. He's a genius. You know, any, he, he's in, in, inspiring. Like, no, you can be really affected. And actually it can have nothing to do with life circumstance. And it could just, you know, happen at 28 years old. I never had this thing and it's just 27 years old. There's a reason why all the, the, the heroes have died at around that age is that there's this thing that happens. They, they, the 27 thing is actually has to do with bipolar disorder. So point is, is I found out that my grandma committed suicide and I was like, wow, what a revelation that like that stigma is still so real that I couldn't even communicate. Like my dad couldn't even tell me, Hey, this is a thing that might have, not that it is, but it might have to do with our family's DNA. Um, and not that it's it's a violent thing. It's not like we're the fucking people who go to Aurora, Colorado and shoot people up. It's harming ourselves, right? But through this, I hope the purpose of what we're doing, and, and thank you for sharing about you, you know your experiences, is that we'll we'll let people know it's okay to share this and communicate about it. Because I got to be honest, my closest producing partner and editor, I know his dad, he's been to every screening of Suffer for Good, he comments and likes every one of my posts. He's a wonderful guy. And I had no idea that he suffers from clinical depression. I had no idea. And, mm. and this yeah. experience, this section of the show has every person has been like, yo, I actually have this thing. And there's something that's going on. We are a hive mind. And and I don't, and I don't forget, like I, even when I was really down, I know there was a night where James, you and you, James and I, we went out and I just needed it. All my friends did that thing. Oh, Dan's a weirdo. Dan's did this. And like James took me out. We went out and we went and saw a concert. You were there. And it was just like, man, I'm, I'm not alone. I'm, I, and I know James knew what, what I was going through, but he obviously has a, he's awakened and enlightened in that regard. 
Mm-hmm. And so I'm. No, I'm he's just, one of the first people that was like putting me on game with that. He's a great person for that. He's a great person. I mean, I I should actually reach out to him to talk on uh, about this as well. He's just so. Thank you for sharing, Christian. This is. I think that this is like a small step in obviously in destigmatizing and and just kind of evolving. I think we'll we'll continue this momentum. So for everyone who does not know Oh, he's got the mask. Yes. The, I, sir, the black teeth. I love it. So a brand new one. Um I have a I bought nice. a few. We did a just to let you know, we did a suffer for good uh like giveaway. So uh, did one of one of the supporters of suffer for good, <laughs> supporters of suffer for good uh dan settle won this so we're going to ship this out after the pod's done um oh, awesome so he's really stoked on that thank you for inspiring us obviously uh do you want to tell us a little bit about the ppe and and the proceeds and all that stuff yeah first of all thank you so much for your support that's that's so awesome so yeah uh you know once around the time awesome you did got started a good friend of mine, um, Garrett Gerson, who, uh, you know, works and runs and owns over, uh, the Calamigos ranch in the Malibu Canyon. Um, he had started a new company called variant and he wanted to get on top of making like masks that were comfortable that people could work out. And he's an active guy and he has his own 3d printer. So he was printing them on site outside of his office. And, you know, I wanted to spread awareness and keep people safe. And I'm also someone who works out all the time. And if you've worked out with any N95 on, you know, it's terrible. And like they, they kind of like the mesh comes off. It's just bad. So I wore one of his prototype masks early on before I started us unmuted. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I was wearing it. Once I started us unmuted, I thought there'd be some kind of like cross collaboration because, uh, they were in full support of all the protests going on. Um, they're just very, such an awesome company and they allowed us to come in make our own designs. Um, you know, and use the proceeds from these masks go 100% to the production of us unmuted to like, you know, helping us hire the cameramen and the people to help us put on crew and um, oh, get people to the sites and pay people to help us edit them. Because other than that, it's just a one man show. It's me. So it helps us continue the process of helping people be heard. Oh, that's great. So, so um, they are really comfortable. They, once again they right uh, they're really comfortable they look really good i mean it's not most, until you put another mask on that you realize like oh shit i can't I wear other masks anymore yeah. you just <laughs> it. no it's it's so it's there's they're they're really nice and the way that they form fit to your face i mm-hmm. i am a guy who does the n95 you know i'm actually the most probably the most paranoid person you know so i do that and i even sometimes do a bandana i'll sometimes do an n90 i'll do the us unmuted and an n95 over it Oh wow, you're I, out here. I'm a. I actually go to the. I have a P100. I'm gonna. I'm, these are like these are these are deep cuts. I don't is know. The, is that the crazy crazy one? Yeah, it's a crazy. It's a gas mask. Which one's the P9? Oh, it's it's a gas mask one. Yeah, it's a gas mask. I'll I'll, I'll text oh, you. Over. I know, dude. I am. I'm like I'm I'm weaseling. If I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna try to weasel just so I can get therapy in person. I'm gonna try to get the Moderna. I'm like, I'm begging because mm-hmm. also for mental health. I, I think I'm gonna. I think I'm going to get it to say like I, if I can get therapy because my, my therapist won't let me see him in person. It's not the same, man. It's just not the same. <laughs> man, man. You got to milk it, milk it, milk I that know. insurance for what it's worth, man. But the reason I want it, number one, if you want to know the truth, 10 mm-hmm. to 20% of guys who get the Rona experience ED. Oh shit! Yeah, I'm not trying to fuck with ED. Yeah, <laughs> it's like they've been they've been trying today. to su- they've been trying to, yeah, the vaccine. They've been trying. Why to don't su- they promote that? That'd be easily I everyone know. Would get on that shit, right? We need some Corona propaganda. Corona it makes your dick not work. Everyone <laughs> Corona, sign me up Corona for this like, vaccine. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll make their own vaccine. Yeah, the the other one, which is the, the other one that uh, is the antithesis of it, is Corona. Te- it actually. 10 to 20% of guys become infertile. They're like, well then, eh. oh, well, you know, for a lot of people that could be a pro or a con, it depends on what you're into. I've been saving my cum in my freezer for years. So I think I'm good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this next section is called smash, Mary kill. And this is uh, Christian. Uh, he, he created a great uh, Instagram story. So it's smash, Mary kill. And we're going to do some feature films. So, uh, quick as you can you know the rules as fast as you can whatever comes to your head so smash mary kill kill bill pulp fiction reservoir dogs god damn you okay this is hard okay kill fuck mary uh kill bill one pulp fiction reservoir dogs yes Ooh, that's hot those are some hot bodies okay i'm gonna marry i'm gonna marry 
Pulp Fiction just because like that bitch is an every day. You, yeah. you can wake up next to her every morning <laughs> and be happy with her. <laughs> and I don't feel as bad about this, but I'm going to fuck Reservoir Dogs and kill Kill Bill only because <laughs> there's a second Kill Bill. <laughs> and you can and kill I, And I could, I could come back to that one later on. So I'm killing Kill Bill. Marrying Pulp Fiction and I, I love Reservoir Dogs and I mean Reservoir Dogs is like a good dirty fuck anyway of a movie like you just feel dirty after it but like you can't look away like so yeah those are my three okay. what else you got for me okay. well how do you feel what's your three with that no I I actually I actually like I like Smash Kill Bill Mary I agree Mary Pulp Fiction it is a beautiful thing you can get it it's it's like it's like it's like marrying ten people you get a new a new film mm-hmm. really there's such great vignettes and then kill Reservoir Dogs because it's just a, it, what a great way to end it's just such a it, I actually it's it's a great piece of writing but I think I like the sex of the Kill Bill thing the foot fetish the way that it goes mm-hmm. around the mm-hmm. katanas but I um that's what I would do. Now we have this next so one. Kill Bill as a movie to me is like foreplay for the second it, one. So it's, like, it's the it's second one for me. Bah, yeah, yeah. Bah, I love right. that. I love the whole the whole. Th- I mean, me too. You gotta love it. God. Yeah. Here we go. The next one is Napoleon Dynamite, half baked, and book smart. Mm. Okay, that one's a little easier. Yeah, um, killing book smart. <laughs> I'm killing book smart, <laughs> which I thought was great. Okay, I loved book smart. I thought it was awesome. Um, it just, uh, you know, every generation has their, has their super bad and that yeah. was not mine. So I appreciate it for what it was though. Um, killing book smart and it was half baked. And what else was the other one? Oh, oh one no. dynamite. Ooh, that's tough. Bro. Right. I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to marry Napoleon and fuck half baked. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think I, I actually kind of a line up. I, I actually might. I'm going to marry Half-Baked. That's one of my favorite movies mm. growing up and, and Dave Chappelle and just the stoner class. It's like one of my favorite classics. Like, It's one of my classics. Too. I haven't watched it in a couple of years, but I used to watch it all the fucking time. Yeah, it's just, I, I actually don't, like I haven't watched it in a long time as well, but you know, I just, it's just, it's based all off the stories of the crux is so bizarre. Feeding up. <laughs> police horse like and you're thinking Bro. about like how i love that shit though he speeds a police horse when he's stoned and they're brain- i mean it's so ridiculous so the next one we have raging bull departed in casino mm-hmm. okay uh damn smash I, mary kill these are, these raging are, bull these are like my dad's favorite movies he puts on um ooh, 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 ooh. the padded <sighs> the padded the question is like which one because the departed and casino for me are both movies that are like full course meals mm. we feel very full after them which usually is my mary choice yeah you know what i mean but they're kind of just equal all right i'm gonna kill raging bull nah, fuck i'm gonna say mary departed and fuck casino but those two they might be each other's mistress i don't know yeah, I mean, yeah, today they might be. I, I would almost like, what do I, what would I do? I wouldn't, I would marry, you know, I would, I would actually smash Raging Bull. I feel that it has the energy of a good, of a good hard smash. A good hard smash. <laughs> It's got that smash energy. It's and, got that smash energy. And then it's I, very fuckable film. It's, and then kill Casino and marry the padded. I, um, and then okay, so we have another one. Smash Mary Kill Training Day. Collateral, Ooh. Heat. Ooh. heat. Oh man, Michael Mann's Heat, recently. so good, right? Um, this is a tough one. Training day, training day, collateral and heat. Oh man, bangers, L.A. bangers. Mary, training day. Mm. No, that's not true. I'm gonna marry Heat. Fuck training day, kill collateral. <laughs> Boom. Next Sorry. one. <laughs> Sorry, I had to readjust. Go ahead. What's the next one? Queen's Gambit, Tiger King, Ooh. making a murderer. Oh man, Queen's. Oh man. <laughs> I never. Wait, I never finished Tiger King. I've seen episodes of it, like, but I've never finished it. I appreciate it for what it is. Uh, Making a murder is one of those other full course meal yeah. style situations. I might go, and I can only watch. I couldn't wake up next to Queen's Gambit every morning. 
<laughs> I would say, I'm sorry, I just couldn't. Uh, you see right through it. And the ending was like, pretty okay. predictable. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just like, oh, okay, it's just ended. All right. Uh, <laughs> so for that reason, I'm going to, I, I'm going to fuck Tiger King because that's a very entertaining thing to watch. I'm going to marry uh, Making a Murderer or, um, and kill Queen's Gambit. As much that's, as I enjoy Queen's Gambit, I, yeah, I, she's getting offed. Sorry. Yeah, you know, I would I would smash Queen's Gambit because... Because you just love that girl. Yeah, that's the only reason. And that, but that's, she's that's, bad. That's, she's definitely bad. That's enough just to do it. And the teeth. I like it. Just Beth Warren. Like, whatever, dude. She's also... She's got the bad... She's got a, a baggie full of pills. It's going to be fun. It's a, it's a hotel. It was a sexy show. I loved it, yeah. It's a hotel night. A hotel. There's some photos. It's weird. It's good. There are going to be some... Bla- like, I'm going to be blackmailed for sure after that night. And there's going to be... You know, but I, and I would definitely... Um, I would not... Mar- I would... I would kill making a murderer because there's it's like very obvious to me and so i'd kill that show oh really yeah oh yeah i'm like but i've also had like falling outs with people over this i'm like how do, how does he tortured cats who tortures cats they they, yeah. they gloss over it that's a murderer kind of thing to do and then i would uh marry tiger king because what a weird thing i mean <laughs> joe jo exotic loves to get married i love that <laughs> i love that he would marry tiger king that's uh, hot. my last one is we have uh super bad boogie nights shawshank Redemption. Oh, what? Who put this one together? (laughs) Just hits all my favorites, but like different levels of my favorites. I mean, that's how you want it though, right? That's a good championship game to (laughs) conference. I was so obsessed with Boogie Nights for such a long time. I'm sorry, Boogie Nights, Shawshank Redemption, and... And Super bad a reference you made earlier. Super bad. Wow. Which movie I just... It's just like the blueprint for so many things. And there's an Elko alumni in the film, McLevin. Shout out Chris Mintz. Chris Mintz. I show love for Elko. Um... Shout out Hunter Cope. I believe he was in. Shout in, out Hunter Cope. Shout out Hunter Cope. Some um, just for existing. Shout out Hunter Cope. Um, <laughs> yes. Hey Hunter just, Cope, you are you are a human. He's out here, he's doing his thing. He's beating the odds. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to marry. You know me. I'm gonna marry Shawshank. I'm gonna marry Shawshank. You got oh, it. Damn, this work gets tough, bro. Ah, oh, you know what? I'm gonna do something that like. No, fuck. I don't know. Okay, yeah. You know what? I'm going to do something that I know is more true to me. And even though I love Superbad so much, Boogie Nights is a film that, like I said, I was obsessed over for so long. Like, I watched it 150 times. So, <sighs> fucking Boogie Nights, marrying Shawshank, and killing Superbad. That's tough. That's a re- it's a hard one. There's like, no... This this one, you wish there were a bunch of smashes, because I would just like to smash them, smash them, and then marry them all, you know, and have a yeah, couple... Wa- right. You know, you, you know, you can marry... That's my and ideal then, marriage anyway, so... <laughs> smash, smash, marry, divorce, and then you can marry another one. It could, ha- it could work yeah. out. We just get you a good divorce attorney, okay, Cap? But no, I actually... Boogie Nights... <laughs> My uh, buddy lived on the street. You know, in the, sh- the shootout scene when they go and they fucking break in, and so I drive past the house. Yeah, the house. It's such weird. a valley house. Such a valley house. Such a valley mm-hmm. windy road. Uh, so that's mm-hmm. Encino Hills. Um, uh, so all right, we're gonna have one, uh, a couple more, and then we're done. Favorite? What's your favorite song cool. on your playlist right now? What are you listening to, dude? Okay, I don't have a. I don't have like a favorite anything, but I'll tell you what I'm listening to right now. Kanye was up because we were listening to it. Um, I listen to film scores a lot. So the last two things I see right here are like film score playlists. Um, I'm really big into R and B. I got some Frank Ocean right here. I love Frank Ocean. Um, I was listening to some Yo Yo Ma. Uh, oh. Uh, okay. I listen to like lo-fi. I'm just like trying to get in the in the vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, favorite song of the past like few months. Okay, I've been on my like. I, I've taken a turn into like I listen to a lot of R&B like I have my whole life so I know it like very well so I'm like mm-hmm. pretty picky but I've taken this turn into like the more like there's a sect of R&B where it's like there's like these pretty boys who are like sad they have like legitimate reasons for being sad it, like within the realm the girls do this too like you think of like her these artists who are like I'm doing R&B I might be good looking but I'm also fucking sad and the way I'm gonna deal with my sadness is like I'm gonna fuck another girl and think about you or like fuck your friend and it's like this it's like very immature it's very immature and sexy but as long as the music is good like the melodies are good like i'm like okay i'm down for this like vengeful fuck boy shit like this, i'm down this with this reverse like emo, emo r&b <laughs> it's all fucked yeah i'm down for emo this like dirty R- grimy immature so e- immature emo r&b is where i'm at right now burger or hot dog burger 
every time. Easy, okay. Pizza or pasta? Unless it's like a fucking Polish or hot link. Uh, pasta. I love them both uh, so Walter, much. Let's go with pasta. Walter White or Jesse Pinkman? Fuck. That's really tough. Right? Like your heart wants to say Jesse, but your mind wants to say Walt. You know what I mean? Like if you say Walt, you know Jesse looking at you like, damn. You know, but if you say Jesse, you know, Walt's looking at you like, cook the fucking meth. It's like, do I want to be yelled at by Walt or do I want the the puppy dog eyes from Jesse? I'm going to say Walt. That was my first instinct. Netflix or Disney Plus? Right now for me, it's Disney Plus for sure. I got to get back into Netflix, but I've been off that shit. Mm -hmm. Good luck or no luck at all? No such thing as luck. I think it kind of is. Fortune. No, no. Yeah, whatever. Make your own luck. I like that. There's no magic pill. There's no magic pill. There's no, it's yeah. Um, dude, that's, that's it, man. Cap. Thank you so much for being on the broken dove podcast. Uh, do you want to plug some things you have going on your Instagram and it, it, you know, us unmuted anything? No, I, I mean, I could plug a lot of things, but the only thing I want to plug right now is you. I think everyone who's listening to this, please listen to Danny Moore, support him, share this episode and his other episodes with your friends. Cause he is something special. That's my plug. Oh, th- thank you. Uh, I'll Venmo you after this. Uh, I will make sure. <laughs> <laughs> My um, dude, this is amazing. Thank you. Nah, Let's thank do a you little, so much. Will you give me a tail clap? Broken Dub Podcast is executive produced by Ellen Utrecht, edited by Megan Solano, audio by Dory Bavarsky, and artwork by Neve Bavarsky. Please like, subscribe, follow, stock, DM, love them all. They're amazing. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your rave reviews, your shares, your comments, your spam to your friends, your email blasts, your clubhouse chats about this episode. Thank you so much. We appreciate all the love, the merits, the action accolades, the attention, and most importantly, the thumbs up. Talk soon. We're out.